Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, February 12th. This is Deacon Barry Taylor. I will be your presenter today. We are still in Unit 3 of the Faith Pathway Adult Quarterly, which is entitled God's Call and Its Responsibilities. God's Call and Its Responsibilities. We are in Lesson 12, which is entitled the rich and the poor, the rich and the poor. Our background reading is taken from Amos chapter 5 verses 7 to 15. I'm sorry, that was our devotional reading. Our background scripture is taken from James chapter 2 verses 1 to 12, which is also our printed passage or lesson text. Our key verse from the King James Version is hearken my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world and rich, rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? That's James chapter 2 verse 5. Lesson aims or number 1. Explore the dangers of showing partiality and favoritism. Number 2. Imagine what it feels like to be poor in the world yet rich in faith and the benefits and challenges of such and then number three identify and celebrate the God-given values of one another after the introduction our lesson has three divisions the first is entitled be careful and that's covered between James 2 verses 1 to 4 the second is entitled, Be Courteous, Hearken, and that's covered between verses 5 and 8. And the third is, Be Cautious, Hear, and that's covered between verses 9 and 12. From the Standard Commentary, our lesson title is, Responsibility of Those Called responsibility of those called and additional aims are number one summarize why favoritism is incompatible with the Christ honoring life number two compare and contrast the biblical concepts concept rather of favoritism with modern definitions of discrimination and number three propose a way to identify and correct occasions when his or her church does not treat people equally. Let's have a word of prayer and we'll get into our lesson background. Father, we do thank you and praise you for, uh, Lord, another day of your love, your grace, and your mercy. We thank you always, Lord, uh, for all that you've done, what you're doing, what you've yet promised to do. We thank you for yet another opportunity to study your precious word. And as always, Lord, we pray that you would give us uh, the correct interpretation by your spirit of your word, Lord, and help us to make the right application in our lives, Lord, and help us to do this, Lord, uh, to your praise and glory. We ask your blessings upon all the, the hearers, uh, and we pray again that they would be faithful doers of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we want to give a little background on, I guess, first the writer of this epistle, entitled James and then a little bit about the epistle itself the letter uh, the writer uh, is has been identified as the half-brother of Jesus who during um, Jesus's uh, life uh, before his resurrection uh, was not a believer uh, however after his resurrection and he saw the resurrected Jesus and was there uh, in the upper room at Pentecost, became a faithful believer. And he actually became a leader uh, at the church uh, in Jerusalem around 40 AD. Uh, we know that he was named with uh, Cephas or Peter and John as one of the pillars of that church in Jerusalem, which also was the it was the, a major church uh, in which or at which doctrine for all the churches was established 
uh, read Acts 15 when you have a chance, uh, where he gives counsel as to uh, how the Gentiles were to be received, what they were uh, required to do, and only what they were required to do. Um, it's believed that he was uh, martyred. Uh, Josephus actually uh, writes that he was uh, martyred in 62 AD. Uh, regarding the letter, the epistle, the epistle was uh, believed to have been written around 50 or in the early 50s AD, perhaps in the 40s, and it was written to uh, Jewish, a, a Jewish audience or a Christian audience, if you will, with Jewish backgrounds. In other words, these were, these were Jewish Christians scattered abroad. He was writing actually to the 12 tribes or the remnant thereof of uh, Jews who had become Christians scattered abroad or dispersed as the uh, adult uh, quarterly commentary state and it was really uh, that's that that name for that dispersion was called the diaspora and uh, he is focusing on the letter actually focuses on uh, what these believers, these Christians, uh, were to do, how they were to live uh, to dem in demonstrating their faith uh, uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, not through uh, rituals or ritualistic observances, but in practice, in everyday living. And so we, 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 we read in uh, chapter, if you read the, the epistle, the entire epistle in chapter one, how he begins by telling uh, his audience to count it all joy when they fall into various trials because these believers were under duress, uh, pursued by, of course, the Orthodox so-called Jews, uh, and he was encouraging them uh, to uh, uh, to use these trials as a means for God to develop their pace, patience and endurance in them. When we get into the chapter 2 and beyond, he speaks of, of practical ways that they can demonstrate their faith. In chapter 2, uh, the again, the first passage that we're going to discuss is... Uh, chapter 2 verses 1 to 4 and it's entitled be careful we're going to read that passage and i'm going to as usual go back and forth perhaps between the niv and the kjv for greater clarity uh and uh, then we'll back up and we'll have some verse by first verse by verse discussion so i'm going to read from the niv this uh, first passage and it reads my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Uh, in the KJV, of course, it says not, uh, don't have respect of persons. And that's what that basically means. Not, do not show favoritism. Verse 2, suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor by my feet, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? The King James Version of that verse says, Are you not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts? Now we're going to back up to verse 1 and again see if we can get greater understanding of that verse. And again it reads, My brothers and sisters, Believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. That's a declaration, a declarative statement. And we all know what favoritism means. It means 
uh, giving special attention and honor to someone uh, over others as opposed to others. Now, we, as we get into this lesson, we want to understand that what James is instructing um, the, his readers or the list of, the readers of this epistle to do is to do something contrary to our human nature. Now, we have uh, become partakers of the divine nature through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so we have a new nature, which we, the Holy Spirit, tries to uh, conform us to uh, throughout the sanctification process, throughout our Christian walk. Uh, it is natural for us to show favoritism to those who are uh, perhaps rich, uh, those who are powerful, those who uh, we perceive are worthy of some honor for some reason, as opposed to others. And so what, as we go through this lesson, let's understand we are being instructed to rely on the Spirit of God, our new nature, and not the old nature uh, in our treatment of others. Now, when he when James gives this statement, this declarative statement, he's actually speaking of something that uh, has to do with God's own nature uh, in regard to uh, the treatment of people. We see this going back to the Old Testament, Deuteronomy ten seventeen. It says, the Lord your God is God of gods, which regardeth not persons, nor taketh reward. Now, God himself shows no partiality, has no respect of persons. We read that throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. And therefore, God wants us to imitate him in our treatment one of another. We read in Acts uh, chapter 10, uh, when God, where God has sent Peter to Cornelius' house um, uh, and to share the gospel with him as he comes in, he says in verse 34, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. In other words, God uh, is going to deal with and treat the Gentiles just as he has the Jewish in calling them to faith in his son Jesus Christ. And we see many, many other places throughout scripture where God himself does not respect, shows no respect or partiality or discrimination among people, and especially among believers. And we are not to do that as well. We're to show no favoritism to anyone that comes uh, within our assembly or anyone that we deal with for that matter, inside or outside of the church. Let's move on to verse 2, which reads, Suppose, and, and James here gives an example of how partiality is demonstrated uh, in verse 2. Suppose a man comes into your meeting or your assembly wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy clothes also comes in. And this, is, this was not... Um, untypical, if you will, in that day. Uh, this assembly or place of assembly, I don't believe is speaking of the synagogue as one of the commentators suggests, but the place where the church worshiped. The synagogue was the place where the uh, Jewish men assembled for worship and reading of the scripture. Um, women typically were not allowed in that the direct assembly of the men. They, there was an outer a place where I think the women could could sit. But um, this is talking about the church. We know the church met in homes, the church met else in other places. Uh, and this, this uh, some rich, uh, as well as many poor, were led to faith in Jesus Christ, or had come to faith in Jesus Christ, and were worshiping, assembling and worshiping together. In, in such cases, I mean, the rich were not... Uh, uh, concern, I guess, about them showing their signs or symbols of wealth, such as the gold ring when they came into these assemblies. That was That's what they were accustomed to wearing, their fine clothes, which were, again, symbols of being well-to-do or well-off. Okay, if you've got a gold ring, uh, that means uh, you have some, some money, you have some means. Uh, 
a poor man, of course, uh, can't even afford to uh, keep his clothes clean because he probably doesn't have more than a change or two. And so the filthy rags uh, suggest that uh, this man is very, very poor. And again, as I said, they worship together. And we see uh, evidences of that uh, in Paul's epistles as well concerning the uh, the, uh, the communion. Uh, we see that in 1 Corinthians where uh, some are coming and bringing uh, large amounts of food and banqueting and so forth while others are in the corner uh, with no food. Uh, and, and Paul corrects them on the, uh, the purpose and how the Lord's Supper is to be conducted. So again, James gives this hypothetical, which really is not hypothetical, it's fairly, uh, it, it was something that was happening. Verse three says, if you show special attention to the man wearing fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand here or sit on the floor by my feet, so, so what, what is that verse telling us that uh, now Paul is uh, about to explain what the result of this treatment, uh, this discriminatory uh, treatment uh, means uh, in the next verse, but what he's demonstrating is uh, just that, uh, a, 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 a favoritism being shown to the wealthy man and uh, dishonor sh being shown to the poor man. Um, and this poor means physically or materially poor, it's not speaking of the spiritually poor necessary that we read about elsewhere in Revelation 3.17 and so forth, but physically poor. So while uh, there was a tendency to show great respect to the wealthy uh, the poor man was disrespected by being asked to stand or to sit, the King James said, by my footstool. Um, and uh, so the next verse says, he says, ha and, and this is a rhetorical question that James is asking, have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Have you not discriminated? Now we uh, have become accustomed to that word discriminate in a very negative sense. And typically, and certainly in the context of our lesson, it is uh, a negative. It is intended as a negative thing or negative practice. However, we don't want to uh, just use that word uh, in every context as a negative. We are we know about having discriminating tastes. Sometimes that word is used uh, as a synonym for discerning. We are to have some judgment. We are to discriminate between good and evil. But in this case, the discrimination is on the basis of some prejudgment, some prejudgment and some partiality, uh, some favoritism uh, for a wealthy man or the wealthy uh, just because of his wealth, regardless of character, regardless of his faithfulness or devotion to the Lord, but simply on the basis of his material wealth. The negative uh, discrimination that we're most familiar with uh, in our uh, day is uh, racial discrimination, of course. There is sexual discrimination, and that's been blown well out of proportion. There's uh, all kinds of um, uh, claims of discrimination against transsexuals and all this and all that, which is has just gotten uh, ridiculous. And some of it, I believe, is out of the pit of hell, quite honestly. But uh, there is uh, a negative discrimination that is practiced even today in our church, uh, our churches, and certainly in our society that God calls sin. And we will address that as we get further into our lesson. So verse four says, uh, he says, are you not, he says again, have you not discriminated among yourselves again, among the, within the congregation and become judges? So you are judging a person on what basis? 
again, not on the basis of character, not on the basis of faithful faithful service to the church of the Lord through his church, but on the basis of wealth, on the basis of this person's stature. Uh, you've given him honor. Uh, and he says, with evil thoughts. So James is making two accusations here. Okay, uh, he he's saying um, uh, and and they're they're in the form of of rhetorical questions. Rhetorical questions are questions with an obvious answer, and the answer in both cases are is expected to be yes. So he says, "Have you not discriminated or become partial in your judgment?" The uh, the King James says. And the answer is obviously yes. The second is he's, he's asserting that you have become evil in your thoughts or judges of evil thoughts, judges having uh, evil uh, with evil thoughts. And the answer, of course, in that of that question is yes as well. Now we need to remember judging is to be objective. Uh, you know the Statue of Liberty uh, has a blindfold, okay? Because the Statue of Liberty is not to prejudge based on appearance, uh, but the blood judge based on evidence presented. Uh, judge judging, uh, and throughout the Bible where uh, we read about judges, it is to be objective based on law and not personal preferences. Uh, rich and poor are to be treated equally under the law in our society they're to be treated rich and poor now, are they no in practice they're not we know that rich people are more likely to get off for uh, the same offense that a poor person might be sentenced to many many years for judges are not to be uh, bribed and perhaps uh, and there, there is realistically a tendency to want to cozy up to wealthy uh, perhaps to get some of what they have and that is a natural tendency uh, as part of our human nature to want to be attracted to be attracted to those who have more than we we have even even for the sake of, of having some of their influence uh, be shed to us or shed shared to us um, uh, you know I, I found myself uh, taking a uh, bit of pride in the fact that I know a billionaire personally. I mean, uh, he's been to my house. Uh, we've known each other for decades. I knew him when, as they say. Uh, and uh, he's a, fortunately, he's a devout Christian man, he and his wife. Uh, and, and we love being with him. But this man is worth $6 billion. Uh, and it's, it's something, even to drop the name that you know this man personally, uh, to be said, uh, and you have to fight the tendency to have uh, 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 any any preferential or discriminatory thoughts about someone that's uh, uh, better off, far better off than you. Uh, but you want to treat every. I don't treat this man any differently than I treat any other friend. So we we started saying earlier, and I'm going to summarize my thoughts on this uh, or comments on this verse in just a minute about this discrimination being against the very nature of God, uh, that is why it is evil, okay? This partiality, this discrimination is sin because it, it's against the very nature of, of God. And we're going to take a look at uh, James chapter 4, verses 11 and 12. Again, remember I said that the judges are to judge impartially or objectively according to the law. Verse 11, James 4, 11 says, Do not speak evil one of another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and the judges, and judges rather the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. There is one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who are you to judge another? That one lawgiver, that L is capitalized, is, of course, God himself. God is the judge of all, and we are not to judge or prejudge. Again, we are to discern between good and evil, 
but we are not to judge or prejudge one another. So let's move into our second division, uh, which is entitled, uh, and again, we just reviewed um, the division entitled, Be Careful. So J James has warned uh, the readers to be careful because they are discriminating and that discrimination is sin. They become judges with evil thoughts. Second division is entitled, Be Courteous Dash Hearken. It's covered between verses eight, I'm sorry, five and eight. Again, from the NIV, it reads, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Verse six, but you have dishonored the poor is it not the rich who ex are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him who, to whom you belong? Verse 8, if you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Now the quarterly commentator says, you know, despite... Uh, James's uh, the firmness of his tone in the, the preceding verses uh, he is speaking uh, in love okay he's addressing the uh, his audience as his dear brothers and sisters uh, and he he continues uh, with the phrase listen he wants them to uh, to listen to him uh, because of the the seriousness of this uh, this practice, if you will. His goal, it says, is to demonstrate the seriousness of the practice of discriminating against the poor. Throughout Scripture, God has so closely identified himself with the plight of the poor and lowly that, in his eyes, a casual disregard for them, uh, in parentheses, in conversation, seating preferences, etc., is equal to despising or dishonoring not only them, but also the Lord Himself. And so we, um, uh, what what James is trying to do here, is to again stress the seriousness of dishonoring the poor, and he is going to uh, try to explain that generally and we're he's speaking in general terms not in uh, every case of course those who they are bestowing bestowing honor on are uh, those who are more likely and more than likely to be mistreating them so let's back up to verse 5 and let's uh, review this verse by verse listen my dear brothers and sisters has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. So from the standard, the, the uh, uh, commentator says, James is gonna present uh, three arguments uh, and uh, to indicate, if you will, or to show uh, why partiality is wrong. Uh, the first, um, First, he points out that uh, favoritism is inconsistent with the fact that God has chosen the poor in this world. And again, this is presented as a rhetorical question. Rhetorical question means one that has an, an obvious answer, and the answer is expected to be yes. Has not God done this? Yes. Generally, those who uh, accept it, and this is true today as it was uh, in the days that James wrote this epistle. Those who are more dependent, who have greater need, or more likely to embrace uh, the Lord Jesus uh, uh, than those who are wealthy, who believe themselves to be uh, uh, have no need to be independent of God, to, to, by virtue of their wealth or their power or whatever. Uh, they don't see the same need of God or the salvation that God offers through uh, his son Jesus as uh, as the poor. And there's so many places where we can see uh, where God, um, uh, where, 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 where the poor 
or those who are rich in faith uh, as opposed to the wealthy. Uh, I'll just give you a few. Um, you can look at Psalms 9, 18, Psalms 10, 14, Psalms 18, 27. There are others, Isaiah 11, 3, and 4, and there are others. Uh, we know it, it marries uh, uh, the Magnificat when uh, Luke uh, chapter 1, actually, no, this is, yeah, Luke chapter 1, verses 46 to 55, and she talks about how the Lord had help the poor and, 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 and so forth, particularly in verse 52. Um, we'll pick up the, uh, the second arguments in the next few verses. Uh, verse 6 reads, But you have dishonored the poor. Is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you in the court? Let's back up to part A. But you have dishonored the poor. So how have they dishonored the poor? By their discriminatory practices, by their treating them differently, by them not regarding them as highly as others. Part B says, uh, do not the rich, this is King James, or do not the rich oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats or the court so the second of the three arguments is again this is framed as a rhetorical question he's asking yes they do that the answer is expected to be yes yes they are the ones that are um, uh, in a position to have properties uh, to uh, to lease to sell to foreclose on uh, Jesus makes a point of pointing out the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees who for pretense, he says, make long prayers uh, at the in the markets and at the corners uh, while they're foreclosing. He, King James says devouring widows' houses, foreclosing on widows' houses. And actually we see that in Mark uh, chapter 12. I'm going to read very briefly verses 38 to 40. And he said, this is Jesus speaking, and he said unto them, in his doctrine, beware of the scribes which love to, uh, which love to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplaces and the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms in, at feasts which devour widows' houses and for pretense make long prayers. These shall receive the greater damnation. Again, uh, we as they were, again, in the days that this epistle was written, are naturally drawn to people with wealth, with status, with celebrity, and what James is trying to do is to get them to have uh, the nature of God, is to uh, use uh, the, the, uh, the, 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 the godly nature that we have become partakers of to combat our natural impulses to show partiality or discriminate okay and, and this we're talking uh, specifically about rich and poor in this lesson in this context in this series of in this passage if you will but this applies obviously to other uh, uh, areas uh, over which or that we discriminate you know of course uh, backgrounds uh, cultures uh, of course race um, sex, and I'm not talking about, you know, homosexuals versus uh, heterosexuals, and this, I'm talking about gender, gender, and there are only two. Uh, sometimes women are discriminated over men or vice versa. Uh, and so, and we know in Christ, there's no male, no female, no bond, no free, no, no rich, no poor. We are all one in Christ. We're all the same in Christ. Let's move on to verse seven. Verse seven. And they not the one are they not rather the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of him to whom you belong. And this presents the third argument James makes. And again it's a rhetorical question. Are they not? And the uh, answer is yes. The obvious answer is yes the ones who are blaspheming and blaspheming means to speak evil of or defame in some manner 
Uh, and the noble name of him, of course, him it being the Lord Jesus, who we belong to. This, this pretentiousness that I just read about in Mark uh, 12, 40, so they, they make these long prayers for pre pretense. Uh, they are, that's a, a form of blaspheming uh, the, the name of the Lord. Uh, and we can see other uh, references or other uh, related verses. Isaiah 52 5 um, the Lord, in Isaiah 52 5 the Lord speaks about uh, the uh, those that rule over his people making them to howl and blaspheme his name continually every day continually uh, so we know that uh, there are some who um, again are hypocrites in the church uh, and uh, have no um, true relationship uh, with the Lord uh, and of course I, as I said the pretense to hypocrisy blasphemes the name of the Lord as did the scribes and the Pharisees in Jesus's day let's move on to verse 8 if you really keep the royal law found in Scripture love your neighbor as yourself you are doing right this is the first and only place we see a royal law mentioned in scripture we have referred to that as the golden rule and we know of course from Jesus's own words as uh, as well as the Old Testament uh, scripture to which he referenced that this is the second uh, and most important second most important law that God gave the first is love the Lord your God with all your heart soul mind and strength and the second is love your neighbor as yourself and we know that and we see that in Matthew chapter 22 verses 34 to 40 uh, we see further when Jesus was challenged as to who is my neighbor by some witty lawyer attempting to prove himself or justify himself in Luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37 the parable of the Good Samaritan, how uh, a, a one who was disdained by the Jews uh, went uh, above and beyond what was necessary to help one who uh, fallen among thieves, been beaten half to death, robbed, stripped naked, and so forth. So what is James saying? James is saying, if you love your neighbor as yourself, and that neighbor being anyone and everyone, uh, then you do well. So if there was any question as to how we are to treat others, uh, in other words, uh, what James is saying is that you treat others as you would like to be treated by them. That's a rule by which we can live. So we're going to move into the third division. Again, we just reviewed the second division, which was be courteous or hearken. In other words, hearken to what uh, James is saying about the seriousness of discrimination or partiality. Recognize that it is sin. And then uh, how to treat others. Be uh, hearken to how we are to treat others and we're to treat others as ourselves. Now, as I've mentioned, uh, fairly recently uh, while the Lord condensed the Ten Commandments that summarized all of the law into two those uh, vertically oriented between God and man and those horizontally oriented between man and man uh, or man and mankind uh, you could really condense that further if you read the uh, James uh, I'm sorry first John to one if we love God and certainly if we love God with all the heart soul mind and strength we are going to demonstrate that through our love of one another we cannot love God who we cannot see and not love our brethren who we can so if we love God we are going to love one another so again let's move into the third division which is entitled be cautious dash here 
and that's covered between verses 9 and 12 and it reads but if ye show favoritism you sin and are convicted by the law as a lawbreaker as lawbreakers rather verse 10 for whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbleth at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it for he who said ye shall not commit adultery also said you shall not murder if ye do not commit adultery but do commit murder you have become a lawbreaker verse 12 speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom okay we're going to back up to verse 9 and again it reads but if you show favoritism or discrimination uh, evil discrimination you sin and are convicted by the law again we are judged by the law now we're not looking at this or understanding this in a legalistic sense you know the mosaic law in this context we're talking about a different law the law uh, that gives freedom which is referred to in verse uh, verse uh, 12 uh, this is the law that uh, uh, not the letter of the law but the spirit of the spirit of the law so what, so what is he saying here in verse 9? Again, he's saying, if you show favoritism, he said, you sin or you are sinning. Now, what makes this a sin? We just said that God has commanded us to love, to love him first and foremost, but also to love others, to love our neighbors. And if we do not love and then we are sinning we do not love our neighbors we are sinning if we are discriminating against our neighbors if we're dishonoring the poor as an example uh, and honoring uh, the wealthy we are uh, sinning we are not loving as God has commanded us to and therefore we are committing sin and convicted of that sin by the law which is to love that law is to love your neighbor as yourself verse 10 for whosoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbleth at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it now we want to understand that uh, God did not give the law uh, the Mosaic law uh, or the uh, uh, the law of Christ and again Jesus said he did not come to uh, to replace the law or to uh, he came to fulfill the law he did not come to, to remove the law but to fulfill it and so whereas uh, we were commanded to do certain things under the Mosaic law the children of Israel were and by extension uh, us uh, we were commanded to go beyond the commandment to do but to do it with the right heart attitude uh, for example Jesus pointed out uh, that if a man uh, looks on a woman not not just not commits adultery physically but if he looks on a woman with lust he's committed adultery in his heart uh, if a man uh, hates his brother and, and had it been, uh, if it were not for some expected punishment, would probably kill his brother or another. If he hates, then he's committed murder in his heart. So what, re what is required under the law of Christ is, is uh, a higher standard than the law of Moses. But, but getting back to, the, to the, the verse here, the Lord did not give the law for us to pick and choose as to which or laws if you will which one we wanted to keep and which ones we wanted to observe or be uh, or honor uh, but he gave the law as a whole he gave them uh, certainly individual specific laws but he also gave them as a whole if we break one of the laws then we are a lawbreaker if you commit one lie you are a liar okay it, it, you might you know we we used to refer to some lies as white lies to distinguish them from more from more serious lies but if we lie we are a liar period if we sin 
we are a sinner okay the commentator says here uh, and this is despite uh, whether we're uh, poor or rich or uh, or uh, whether we're uh, black or white uh, it doesn't matter and and that's why we, there's no way we could have been justified or made right or given a right standing or saved by the works of the law because if we've had a sinful thought uh, we have uh, we've, be, we've sinned and condemned ourselves to death the soul that sinneth the Bible says shall die so the Lord was the only person who was perfectly sinless the, blimp, the, the, the lamb without blemish uh, and able to be justified by the law and the suitable sacrifice for the sins of the world. And then he goes on to give an example in uh, verse 11. He says, For he who said, You shall not commit adultery, he says, Also said, Ye shall not do murder. If you do not commit adultery but commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Again, it's those are individual laws, specific laws, but if you break one of them, you are a lawbreaker. You've broken the law. Again, the law was given as a, a package uh, to be observed so that we would be perfectly holy before the Lord. And of course, the Lord knew that we could not be perfectly holy. So the law was a mirror for us. It was something to point out our sins, to point out our flaw, flaws that the Lord Jesus would uh uh, be a, would, would take away uh, by his sacrificial death okay and then finally verse 12 says speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom so Paul uh, James is giving a final instruction here as to how we are to behave uh, how we are to conduct ourselves Okay, now we, we often think of, of laws as restricting us, um, as being, uh, we speak of it in terms of restrictions, but the law of liberty or freedom, the law that gives freedom that James is speaking of here, is uh, one that is, it's referenced in uh, uh, James, we get back up to James uh, one twenty five, which reads, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty um, and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Also, looking at uh, Romans chapter 8 and verse 2, we read for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death we're talking about um, again not a law of restrictions but a law that enables us uh, to be uh, free, uh, being free from sin to act in accordance with the spirit of the living God. It frees us uh, from our sinful nature to, again, as I said earlier, it's, it's part of our nature to discriminate, to want to curry favor to the rich and the powerful and the influence and enjoy some of their celebrity. It frees us to be able to love one another as ourselves. This is the law of liberty. And we need to recognize that our obedience to the law of liberty brings true freedom, freedom from sin that binds us to the desires of our flesh, the desires of our human nature. I'm going to read, in summary, I'm going to read um, some closing uh, thoughts from first the uh, Dull Quarterly and then from the, uh, from the Standard Commentary. Closing thought from the quarterly, James James's warning against favoritism is an expression of God's love for all people and an affirmation of the worth of every living soul. 
There are no superstars or celebrities in God's house. God is the main attraction. The church should be a warm, welcoming place where believers from every social rank and background may gather to worship God and experience the love of God through others. We should experience the love of God through others, through each other. Now from the standard. Today's text is justly famous for the specific sin that it identifies and condemns. Discrimination grows out of our fallen human nature, a nature that is drawn to wealth and status, or at least proximity to it. Everyone is subject to its allure, and we all can think of instances when the temptation has been present for us. James's teachings are, therefore, for us as well as for his initial readers. May we take this lesson as an encouragement to examine the patterns of our lives and to root out prejudice, replacing it with love. All of us have uh, these tendencies that we want to root out of our lives. We want to uh, root, not uh, obey the old human nature but obey the spirit of the living God. Let's go before the throne. Father, we do thank and praise you again for the opportunity to study your word. Lord, we thank you uh, for what you've taught us. And we pray, Lord, that we would make application of this in our lives. Lord, we pray that we would, uh, day by day, Lord, that we would uh, kill the old man, the old nature, Lord, and yield ourselves more fully to your spirit and, and act in accordance with our new nature, Lord. Uh, we thank you again. We ask your blessings upon all the hearers, all the households represented, all the churches represented. In Jesus' name, amen.